Hey everyone, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski. Thanks so much for joining us on episode number 67 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest undeniably has one of the most interesting stories in poker. She was one of the subjects of an outstanding documentary entitled Bet, Raise, Fold. That, however, was just the beginning of her story. She's gone from an online crusher living in Minnesota to having taken that away by Black Friday to transitioning into a tremendous live catch game player now based in Las Vegas. This woman is now one of the more recognizable and successful faces of our game today. And she's also a great wife, mother, and a great friend to many. On this episode, we'll get to know her a little better. D-Moon girl, Danielle Anderson, welcome to the Cards Chat Podcast. Dang, I need to come on here like once a week so I can, you know, get the that pump up. That was quite the intro. Yeah. <laughs> we do feel, weddings and bar mitzvahs also. Myself right now, you guys really are the friendliest. <laughs> <laughs> gotta gotta get the hype. And also, like lots of times, someone's like, "I've heard that name before," or "I've I've seen her before," like that sort of a thing. So it's good to start to kind of give the context as we get into it. And you know, lots of folks not aren't necessarily watching the video. You got to give the good full verbal uh, verbal intro. So I'm glad you like it. Points over here. You can say nice things. <laughs> um, and, and also just, you know, frank full disclosure for everyone in the audience, Danielle and I have actually been connected on social media for a number of years. We've collaborated on some written pieces before, but this is actually our first conversation. So I'm really excited about this. And thanks so much, Danielle, for, for making the time to join us. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. So um, many folks, myself included, we first heard who is, you know, Danielle Moon Anderson, uh, after watching Bet Ray's Fold, this movie, uh, phenomenal documentary, side note, uh, if anyone out there has not yet watched it, go do that after you finish listening to the show. It's phenomenal storytelling. You can find it on YouTube, I think also betraysfoldmovie.com. Uh, so before we get into my questions to you related to that movie, though, can you please just sort of tell us, Danielle, what about poker captured your imagination and interest that you decided to, to really jump into it full-time online where you were known as, as D-Moon Girl? Yeah, I mean, I just, I love the game. I mean, I'm just like every poker player, you know, I started playing and I just got the bug and just like couldn't get enough of it. And in the beginning, I never had in my wildest dream set out for it to be like a career, you know, it just sort of accidentally transitioned into that where it was, you know, playing in college for you know, it's free rolls and then pretty soon, you know, playing five cent, 10 cent. And then, you know, pretty soon it was like, oh, I think I can make more doing this than I can working my college job of $8 an hour, you know? And so it was like, oh, well, let's put the, the you know, job at the shoe store. And then just kind of could have winning. And I was in college, uh, I was going to be a, a teacher, but I wasn't really like passionate about it. I was kind of questioning that. I was three years in. And so it was kind of a good uh, segue to be like, well, I'm just going to take a little break and figure out what I want to do. And by the way, you know, keep playing this poker thing. And it just kind of all spiraled from there. Really cool. I mean, do you kind of just in general like strategic thinking? Do you like all sorts of games? Like what is it specifically about I'm, poker? That, you know, that I'm actually the total weirdo poker player who doesn't like other strategic games, really. Like I I'll play some, you know, my husband and I play backgammon or whatever, but in general, I don't, I'm not somebody who runs to, uh, oh, I want to learn this new game. I want to like this, you know, deep strategy stuff. In fact, I get kind of frustrated because I feel like the learning curve for me is I don't catch on as quick as other people. So people are like, oh, you know, uh, learn this mix game. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. My brain doesn't work that way. Like I, it, you know, it takes longer for me to process those things i feel like i'm a weird poker player in that sense and that's why it, i mean it makes it even more incredible and crazy that i did even learn poker because you know when i did learn i was even more in that like young and secure stage where you're afraid of looking stupid you know yeah. and so poker is such a complex game that it's the exact type of game that i would avoid generally but my boyfriend, now husband, and his buddies were playing so often in college that I was like, well, if I'm ever going to hang out with my friends, I better learn this stupid game. Right. Uh, <laughs> so it's just kind of crazy that, yeah, I, that I somehow found my way into it. Cause no, That's interesting. Yeah, I'm kind, of a, I'm kind of an outlier as far as a poker player uh, personality type and skill and strength set. I don't like math. Uh, but I, I love the ever-changing dynamics of poker. And I think that, like, you know, you hear the word meta and you know whatnot and i think that's kind of what i always excel at um and if i didn't know understand the concept of why i was doing something 
I was smart enough to like pay attention to what the players who I knew were better than me were doing and just kind of like imitate that. And I think that kind of got me along until the point until I was ready to actually understand some more of those concepts, you know? Right. And, and, and like you said, you know, in the beginning, you kind of just were winning a lot. And, you know, the, the successful ones, the ones who've stayed, you know, in poker for so many years, decided to make it a career. You do kind of have that common denominator that like they kind of experienced success right from the beginning, perhaps not necessarily too much success. You finished fourth in the tournament, you didn't win it, but that kind of like sparked your interest. Also, you've been married for a while and I, I know what it's like. I've also married 19 and a half years and you know, you have that first sort of infatuation stage with your partner. Same with poker as well. Do you find that your love for the game has grown over the years and in a similar way? That's kind of, I feel like a two part question because mm -hmm. um, in one sense, yes, up until COVID, definitely. Um, mm. I think that it's evolved to I've grown to more love like you know playing live poker and the people that i meet and people are so interesting and i you know in poker anybody can come sit down the table and so just interacting with people from all these different you know areas of life that i otherwise would not be exposed to and being challenged by you know different groups and different mindsets and things like that like that's kind of more what i've grown to really love about poker um since COVID, you know i'm not gonna lie there's something about it that like um it doesn't quite have as much of the appeal as it used to. Um, so I'm kind of trying to wade through that. And I don't know, COVID was weird times. Maybe I just need to get back in there, uh, jump back in, but I haven't played much live and I honestly don't really miss it so much. So I don't really know, kind of in a weird spot with that. That's fair, yeah, it's definitely ups and downs. <laughs> like I, I, can, I can relate to that as well. Um, when you started uh, out in Minnesota, uh, you started playing online. Now, we know that there is quite a vibrant live poker scene in Minnesota. You got, you know, you're running aces. Uh, uh, like I think P Potawatomi, I think is up there. Uh, you got a, a Canterbury. Canterbury cards. Sure. There's like, a, you know, it's a lot of, you know, a, a very vibrant Minnesota poker scene. Yeah, I think it even has its own uh, Minnesota Poker Hall of Fame. Why did you decide to go to the online streets rather than, than play live when you started out? Well, I mean, I lived in Minnesota, but I lived in the middle of nowhere, Minnesota. So, uh, I mean, you know, we're talking towns that are, you know, 20 miles apart and separated by just cornfields. Uh, I didn't, you know, I grew up in a town of 1200 people. My husband grew up in a town of two, 300 people. Okay. So yes, there's a vibrant poker scene, but I was 90 minutes away from the nearest like card room, you know, uh, I lived in, yeah small town, small country town. So there, there might've been a poker scene in Minnesota, but it wasn't where I was actually located. Okay. That's fair. I mean, I'm from LA originally and you just sort of think of it as flyover country and guilty, you know, so he doesn't don't, don't know the <laughs> yeah, distances Yeah, no, it's very, well. uh, you know, there's, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, geography between kind of the big cities and the smaller rural ones. So gotcha. that's way very rural. Gotcha. Okay. Well, you know, like you said, you know, you're, you know, we're known today as a, as a live cash game pro, but it was a windy road uh, to get there. It's a lot of very unexpected twists and turns to arrive uh, at the point you currently are in your career. So let's talk a little bit about Bet Race Fold, uh, Black Friday, and kind of everything that, that came with it to help make you the poker player and the person uh, that you are today. Um, you were featured along with Tony Dunst, and uh, we had Martin, Martin Bradstreet. Bradstreet. Right. So how were you, like, why, why you? Why you three? Like, how were you approached and, and, and what made you say, okay, yeah, let's go, let's go for it? Well, I, I mean, I can't speak for, you know, why the other two were, you know, their experience. But for me, it was a really super crazy fluke thing. I'm not a big believer in things being meant to happen, but this is just like such a weird set of circumstances that led to it. Um, I was playing high stakes and had been for a while under the screen name D Moon Girl on Full Tilt. But I kind of would lurk, but I literally, I, I never ever posted in like two plus two or anything. But I saw some of the guys that I, you know, would play against there. And one day I woke up and my account was locked, my Full Tilt, and I, I had no idea why, I didn't know what to do. And you also remember like, I didn't have a peer network of poker player friends. Like I was just doing my thing by myself and you know yeah. so i didn't really know what to do i emailed full tilt anything back so i went into the high stakes forum and i said hey um you know just in the chat or whatever like this is you know i play under demon girl my name is danielle anderson i know some of you guys play me can anybody help me with this or know what's going on and that happened to be the very day that 
like Ryan Verbo and they had gone on to that same uh, like thread. It was just like a general chat thread or whatever to like announce the documentary. And so I wasn't oh. paying any attention to that, but then people were like trying to help me. And uh, you know, like Cole South was, you know, responding to me within the thread. And then Ryan Furpo, the director for the film, he like sent me a, a message and he's like, are you really D moon girl? Or, like, are you really a female? And I'm like, yeah, like what a weird question, you know? Cause I didn't even know that was like weird. And then he kind of went into the pitch of, oh, we're doing this documentary, you know? And at first I was like, yeah, right. This sounds like, no, this is stupid. But then, you know, there were some very reputable names attached to it, like uh, Taylor KB and uh, Jay Rosencrantz and, you know, all these yeah. people. So uh, that was kind of where the initial dialogue started. And at first I was thinking like, no, probably not. But my husband and I, we talked about it. And on one hand, I was a little bit hesitant to like open up, you know, kind of, you know, probably wouldn't seem like it. Uh, I think I'm yeah it was a totally private. natural yeah. on camera appearance yeah <laughs> yeah and it was kind of like a really big decision you know and also to just kind of like expo not like expose but like open up our family and you know yeah. things like that and kind of come up from behind that curtain but we did talk about it and you know at that time there was you know the legal area was like there's it's kind of gray and so it was like well you know I do feel like poker is mis misrepresented and I feel like uh at that time you know and I felt like I could be a good example, you know, in this documentary about somebody who's not a degenerate gambler and just out like, you know, spending money on strippers and blow. I'm here, you know, like a normal person raising a child, having a family and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, we decided to go with it. And, and then in the middle of it, Black Friday happened. <laughs> right. Yeah. So like the, and you can kind of sort of see that shift. You know, I watched it again, uh, ahead of uh, of having this conversation, and it's so funny watching it. You know, all these years later, uh, you know, now you know, I, I know like everyone in the film, um, but it's just um, it's so interesting that pivot midway through. I mean, before the Black Friday, though, you know, your stole your story, like you said, is told directly through you opening up your family. Your parents were interviewed. You know, your husband was interviewed, um, and then of course, you know how all of that gets impacted when you see the DOJ sign on the on the full tilt site. Um, you know, well, I guess, what, like you said, you were kind of anonymous and, and, and unknown, like they didn't know, are you really D Moon Girl? To oh, go ahead and open that up, what does it feel like to have basically not just your poker, but your life chronicled in, in that way? Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it was really, kind of surreal weird experience to have a camera in my face like 24 hours after the you know I'm not I've lived a very blessed life I'm not going to say that it you know I understand people got but at that point in time that was the worst thing that like you know ever happened to me um and so it it was kind of surreal to have like a camera there and I was just sort of still in like a, a stunned state so uh but I think that that's what comes through on the camera you know it, like in it within the film of Bet Race Fold right. is that I was just very vulnerable and you know the emotions were real and authentic and and i know that so many other players you know felt were going through the same thing so it was hard and at the time part of me wanted to just be like get the fucking camera out of my face yeah you know but at the other you know the other side i could feel that this was like a big moment and that it was important that it be represented like uh you know how this is affecting people and like I said, normal people and families and, right. you know, it just, it just felt so, and it still does hypocritical and unfair that even within that moment with everything else like going on, I could kind of recognize like, okay, you know, it's almost like my responsibility to let people in to this, to like, you know, so that other people can empathize and see what this was like for, you know, poker players and whatnot. I mean, well, when they conceptualized the film originally, they kind of had a particular idea and a goal in mind, and then this goes ahead and happens. And like you said, there had to be a pivot. Did they sort of approach you and say, well, things are going to change now? Or they just sort of kept the cameras rolling and, and continued to chronicle? Were you kind of like consulted as part of that? Yeah, no, no, no. They just kept the cameras rolling. They were just, hmm. you know, they, that, they realized instantly too like this is the biggest thing that's ever happened in poker and on one hand you know they were devastated they were all in part of the poker you know community as well on the other hand you know as filmmakers right. they were like holy shit we <laughs> happen to have like you you know all this footage and whatever and all this lead up and then like wow what a you know film if it's going to happen anyways like what a 
you know, how lucky to have already basically had like the perfect lead up to it and to tell the story with, you know, because it would be, it would be, how do you tell that story if you don't have like footage and interviews and stuff up to that? And you right. can't, you know, you can't just like recreate something like that. It just wouldn't come through as, as it did. So yeah, it, it was, I suppose, you know, it's cool for you to in retrospect, but yeah, from the perspectives of the filmmakers, it was a pretty good, it was a pretty yeah, good thing to Yeah, have. exactly. I mean, you know, yeah, Ryan, the director, you know, he's, he was the first thing he thought was just like, get on a plane, get to Danielle. Like, cause you know, right. uh, you know, we all had our different situations, but I think he knew that I was probably going to be the one that was most, uh, uh, you know, pile of tears. <laughs> sure. sure. And, and look, I got to say, and I kind of like, you know, when you're watching it and it kind of breaks your heart, all of a sudden there's like the little like, three second snippet that you're waiting tables all of a sudden. But then there was also that, okay, you're saying goodbye to your husband, your son, and, you know, then you're flying to, I guess, LA to go ahead and play for a week, and then you're back home. What Were you also waiting tables? That that's that was sort of that's, unclear. Like, how, how'd that so work out? That's my only semi-complaint about the film. And I understand mm. from a filmmaker's perspective, but I was, my friend's boyfriend owned a bar, and I was bored and they needed some help. And I, I would like pick up a shit, you know, it's not like I was like, just, oh, now I need to wait tables to pay the bills. Like, yeah, right. I was, you know, making a little extra money or whatever, but I was still primarily a poker player. And I did kind of feel like that got a little bit misrepresented okay. um, for the story. So that was, you know, literally probably my only complaint, but okay. at the same time, you know, I was waiting tables, Right. you know, <laughs> but yes, I was still, uh, you know, going to, I would, you know, like, like it shows in the film, I would go out to LA to play at the Commerce Live, sure. uh, you know, for maybe like 10 days every two months or so. Sure. So I know it also said that, and you were very, very proud that you had completed your nursing degree. So when Black Friday happens and, you know, you're being chronicled, whatever, and obviously we know the path that you did choose, but did it ever at any point, like part of why you go and finish the degree is to have that sort of safety net of a just in case. And I couldn't help but think, I was like, well, you know, talk, talk about a, a just in case type of scenario here. Did you ever say, you know what, let, this is a sign or something like that. Let me just go and, and you know, thankfully I got my nursing degree. Let me go pursue that. We had kind of, you know, we did talk about it, but ultimately like poker was my dream. And I kind of felt like, you know, it wasn't the end of the road. It was like a weird, you know, it was a, a tough pivot, but I got the nursing degree as a backup plan, but right. I kind of felt like it would be in order to be a good mom and a good wife. And this is something that I like very firmly believe or to be the best, I should say, like, I think that I need to be like true to myself. And that, and of course I'm factoring in, you know, my husband, my son or whatever, but if I'm unhappy and feel like I haven't, you know, that I sacrifice all these things, I just don't think that I could be, uh, as, have the same relationship and, you know, not sort of be resentful and look back and whatever. And I want, and my husband was very supportive. You know, he never once did he, in fact, I mean, there was times when I was like, maybe I shouldn't do poker. And he was like hundred percent convinced, like, this is the way for you. Like we're, we're doing this, you know? So yeah, I mean, the nursing plan, it was a backup and I wanted to, you know, show my son to be responsible and there's a chance I still end up using that sometime in the future but during this period no it was just kind of like a, how are we gonna make this work and then once the traveling to LA you know my son was at a age where it just it was really hard on him and hard on me and we kind of came to a point where it was like all right either something's got to change because I don't want to keep doing this so either we're gonna uh you know move or I'm gonna switch careers or you know like it was just one of the two. It wasn't, wasn't some, wasn't sustainable. And that happened to be about the same time that, uh, ultimate poker came along and had offered mm -hmm. me a sponsorship in Vegas. So it just, it became a no brainer. My husband and I, we had always talked about potentially leaving Southern Minnesota. We had always talked about like kind of dreamed about living in Vegas, but when you're in a really small town and, you know, people don't leave, honestly, like there's, it's just kind of, it, it feels like this, such an insurmountable task to like, just move somewhere big, you know, it's so overwhelming. Yeah. So I'm really thankful for the ultimate poker opportunity because that was kind of the push that we needed. And then once we did it, we're like, oh, this isn't so scary. Like, this isn't so bad. You can move anywhere. Like, did you guys know that? You can just pick up and go anywhere you want. It's great. Like, <laughs> if you don't like something, just move. Who knew? What was that transition like though? 
it was awesome honestly um it was tough to it was scary the lead up to it was more scary you know like the uncertainty we had both lived in small towns our whole life both of our families were there at the time my son was the only grandchild on like all the sides so that was tough um you know being like hey we're moving across the country uh with your only grandchild who you know they were all very close to and we're doing it to pursue you know mostly to pursue my poker career like you know uh that was kind of i think uh understandably a tough pill to swallow and i think that at the time some people may have viewed that as like me being selfish but i think with time it's just become apparent that our family is so much happier you know my husband and i are like we just we maybe didn't recognize it at the time but like i just we weren't meant to live in that environment forever. It's just not who we are. So, you know, everything's great now. We're very close to their families and, you know, we do lots of visits. And I think uh, my son kind of has the same mentality. He's 14 now and he, you know, loves living in a, a bigger area and is kind of like, oh yeah, I like to visit small towns in Southern Minnesota, but I don't ever want to live there, you know? Right. That's cool. That's a very you know insightful response because, you know, we, we think of you know, just big cities all the time, like, you know, the, the, you know, urban urban versus rural type of living. I'm sure many of our listeners out there in the Cards Chat audience, you know, are folks who also live in towns of, of 1,200 people and, you know, maybe dream in or are scared of, you know, pushing beyond that comfort zone and, and pursuing something that they love. And especially, like you said, you know, like it's, it's not just risky in that everything else sense, but it's also, it may not work out. This is not, you know, like a job with a high tech company or, or something like that. Um, you know, this is, this is poker. We're on the turn of a card. It, it may not uh, necessarily go your way. What was it? Was it ever in your mind of like, we're going to try this for a year or two and see if it works out and if not go back, or was this, I'm going all in. Uh, well, let me just back up and say one thing first because you mentioned that there might be other people who are listening to this and why not i i think that we sometimes look at risk the wrong way um i think that we need to understand that there yes there's risk to taking chances and to maybe like leaving that small town or trying this job or you know taking this big leap of faith but i think the bigger risk is to stay in an environment that you're not very happy with and you're not living like a very fulfilled life. Like to me, that's the riskiest thing that we can do. Like, what are we doing? You know, if you're not happy, you want to like try something different. There's so many things, there's so many careers, so many places, so many people. Like if you are feeling unfulfilled and unhappy with where you are, like for the love of God, try something different. You know, I know so many people who just, they're like miserable and they just, it's like, they just stay in this rut because they feel like they can't try something else. You can, you know? So I don't know. just wanted to say that because I, 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 I don't know it. what that's I, like. I absolutely uh, love it. Sure. <laughs> but anyways, as far as moving to Vegas, we didn't put a timeline on it by any means. Uh, we, you know, got out of here and rented a place because we were like, oh, not sure if we'll like it. Uh, and, but I mean, it was apparent very quickly that we were not going back. I mean, within a month maybe you know like it just uh, that stores were open past 8 p.m that yes, sort of thing it clicked, yeah. yes and like <laughs> there wasn't uh you know minnesota winter it was uh-huh. like sunny you know we didn't have to every once in a while scrape ice off our car yeah. we were just <laughs> you know we were like overwhelmed with like oh my god can you believe we lived there for so you know like I, i'm glad we're from there don't get me wrong no disrespect right. minnesota love it but um i'm glad to be from there and i have no interest in living there again so right. it, yeah, it, it was just like a, you know, we're going to try it kind of basis, but it very quickly became like, okay, you know, this is, we're, we're here for a while. I hear that. Okay. So we will talk, uh, in, you know, in the next question about um, ultimate poker, since you mentioned it, a short, a short lived uh, Nevada only online poker site. Um, but before I just kind of want to like get a sense, you know, your roots are in online poker. Um, you know, we know that you can play legal online poker right now in, in Nevada. Um at this point, and obviously COVID has kind of like thrown everything, you know, plans uh, out the window, you kind of have adjust on the fly, but how would you say you split your poker play uh, online and live at this point? At this point, I am like 95% online, but it's not regular online. It's um, this private game on an app that started at the very beginning of COVID just with some close friends. It kind of grew. Oh. Circle got a little bit bigger. Uh, it's just kind of like gone on and on. And we all know each other and, you know, so 
that is just, uh, you know, too easy to do from the comfort of my home. And I know these people, yeah. I like them, you know, whatever. So I have no idea how long that will last. It could end tomorrow. It could go for another <laughs> year. It could, you know, it, it's like one of those things where I'm just like not putting expectations. I'm just like, oh, well, it's here now. So this is what I'm going to, you know, kind of focus on. Are paying uh, the DM. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then, but you know, when that specific private club game ends, I don't, I'm not an online poker player. Like I, it's not, I have, if my options were to play exclusively like online poker in a regular setting where you don't know everybody and you know, whatever, um, or go into nursing or get some other job, I would definitely go the other route. I don't have any interest in sitting behind a computer and clicking buttons. Um, it's just not my things. I like, I really much like the social part of poker. I like, like I said, meeting people and, and all that. So, you know, once this app game runs out, I would say it will shift quickly back to, you know, 95% live. Well, I mean, if the, we, we all kind of hope and dream, you know, we always like, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if, you know, online, but back in you know, the wild west days when anyone could play from anywhere, <clears throat> that would be amazing. I think, you know, very, very slowly we're, we're, we're moving towards that and it'll never be what it used to be. But in, you know, here, a, a scenario where you were offered the opportunity to once again represent an online poker site, is that an opportunity you would take, um, you know, again, like given what you've said right now, nonetheless, there is something to be said about, you know, being an ambassador, a higher profile, you know, a little bit of extra, you know, kind of secure income. Is that something that still appeals to you? You know, it would depend on the circumstances. I'm, I'm not going to say no. I mean, I would probably be more interested in something that, you know, was a deal with live tournament appearances and interacting mm -hmm. with people and, you know, maybe hosting like things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, the whole like sponsorship thing, it doesn't really mean as much to me as it used to. Uh, if the right opportunity came along, I'd, I'd consider it, but honestly, I also kind of don't really mind, you know, I don't want to say like, not certainly not living in like anonymity, but I don't want to be like, super famous either you know i always I, I joke and i say that i would rather i mean i would take one for the team but i always joke and say that i'd rather like take second the main event the first because i don't want all you know i would kind of be like oh this is overwhelming but uh i'll take one for the ladies i suppose i'll take first if i have to but. <laughs> cool oh well, there's um i think even like you know like the most famous well, not, not phil but let's say uh daniel negrano you know, he even also knows, yeah, I'm sure he's told before also like, you know, walk into any poker room, everyone knows who he is, but there's poker famous and and, and real famous yes. beyond that. You can still walk around, you know, kind of anonymous and, you yeah. know, in, in a Minnesota supermarket or something like that. So. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Um, as far as your career wise, so, you know, you did make that transition from live to online when you moved from Minnesota to Las Vegas. Did you kind of feel the need to, to sort of prove yourself again, or you already, you know, obviously you had experienced a ton of success before you had bought your mom a horse. And I think that was a beautiful thing that she always wanted. Um, and like you said, also again, in that film, which just resonates about anything that you managed to, I want to say accumulate, but to achieve, I suppose, for your family and, and you know, resource wise, it came to you through poker. So you did have that, you know, going for you. Did you feel like you needed to sort of do it all over again in the live scene? And, and was there a point where you're like, okay, now I made it? Or was it just a, a re relatively seamless transition for you? Uh, it was actually more of a difficult transition than I thought mm -hmm. uh, going to live. Thankfully, at that point in time, uh, I had a backer for live poker. So that helped, um, you know, with that transition. But everybody was like, oh, online is so much tougher. And you know, live is so soft. And so like I had been, you know, beating online. So I think I just kind of assumed like, oh, this is going to be easy, but you know, you gotta, it's a different game. And it, uh, it took a little bit of a learning curve for me to figure that out. But so it was a little bit humbling, but as far as like proving things, I didn't really feel like I needed to prove anything to like the poker community or like, you know, people who knew who Demon Girl was or anything. I more so felt a need to prove that, this was the right decision that I made for my family that like, uh, you know, for like the people that were like, Oh, you know, cause at the time, you know, the longer you go as a poker pro, like by now I've done this long enough. that I feel like I kind of have like the ultimate credibility that people are no longer like questioning, like whether or not this is a smart, viable, risky, you know, career move. <laughs> but at the time, you know, 
I had been playing, but I didn't have like, you know, massive success. And to the people in Southern Minnesota who are like, what the hell, you're moving your son to Las Vegas? Right. You know, um, the last thing I wanted was like, you know, have to kind of crawl back with my tail between my legs or, you know, whatever. So I did feel a need to prove it in that regard and also to prove to myself because I didn't, you know, I would have felt terrible if I made the wrong decision for my family, you know? Um, so I guess, yeah, that was kind of more of where my head was at, but it also didn't take too long of being here to be like, okay, you know, I can make a living doing right. this. Okay. That's fair. I mean, the game has obviously evolved a lot over the last, you know, since, since you started your career. Um, and you, you know, when you said, you said when you started, you kind of went at it alone. You didn't know about, you know, community, you didn't bounce ideas off other people. Has the way you approach the game changed over these years? Are you now like, you know, hitting the the solvers and, and the books and, you know, bounce, you know, you have like a study group, anything like that, or you still kind of like chart your own path? I st I'm still kind of a, I don't know. I'm a little, um, I don't really have, I don't really do as much as I probably should. Uh, I don't, you know. Definitely don't do the solvers. I don't do anything like that. Um, I don't. I'm on team no solver. I'm just yeah, you know, like that, it makes you come, feel better. <laughs> I don't come into uh, you know poker with the ego of like, oh, I'm like a really really good player. I think I'm a I think I'm a above average player who uh, has like networked well enough and plays in good enough games now that you know I can beat those games. I don't, right. uh, you know, I, I don't think that I'm like a superstar who's would have a chance in hell at playing all these like guys who've got to figure it out, you know? Uh, so yeah, I, I don't do as much as I probably should. I'm kind of still, I'll talk hand histories every once in a while with people. I used to, I was so insecure. I had such imposter system or imposter syndrome, like being in the poker world. I felt like I didn't belong here. I felt like I just, this is kind of a fluke and it's going to end at any point. And so I would like shy away from even talking about a hand with somebody. Cause I felt like I'm going to be like exposed and be like, Oh, she doesn't really wow. know what she's doing. You know? Uh, but now, you know, I'm confident enough, secure enough that like I can do that stuff. I'll be like, you know, talk about things or whatever. But no, I'm not at home just grinding out uh, strategy videos or solvers or anything like that. Right. But you do what, what worked for you. Like, you know, like, I think I forget who it was. You can be like the eighth based player in the world. But if you're playing with the seven ones better than you, you know, you're, you're the fish at the table. I think if you're just playing games, you can be that. That's fine. That's great. Yeah, exactly. I'm, you know, I don't come into this with any big ego. I'm not trying to be the best in the world or pretend that I am or anything like that. You know, I'm just trying to make a decent living and, you know, retain my independence. That's a happy. lot. There's a lot of satisfaction to be found in that. Good on you. That, that's great. Um, well, you talk about, you know, making it, you were included in Lance Bradley's award-winning book, The Pursuit of Poker Success, Learn from 50 of the World's Best Poker Players. Obviously, it features a who's who of the poker world. So <laughs> what does it mean to you after everything that you've said in your career? You know, we're like, so I kind of like build into this. What does it mean to you to be included uh, among those 50 people? Uh, I mean, it's super flattering, but I, you know, I don't, and <laughs> It's super flattering and it's awesome and it's surreal and it's whatever, but I don't actually think I'm one of the best 50 poker players in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I've been around for a while and, you know, I'm a female and I'm recognizable and, uh, you know, I have had success in my, uh, you know, paths, but I don't, you know, if we were going to go, but then again, if you were going to take the actual 50 best poker players in the world, it'd probably be a very uninteresting book. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I think that, yeah. Brad had a nice, you know, selection. And also, you know, what's the definition of best? You know, like, I mean, is it the best if you're, you know, I'm probably at this point, one of the longest females that have sustained a career, you know? Sure. Uh, so I don't know, you know, it's kind well, of- I, One of the criteria for Hall objective. of Fame is having stood the test of time. So that, that definitely, ought to count for something so yeah there we go I, I feel like man it makes me feel so old to say that but <laughs> but yeah I mean I feel like I've you know let's see I've been doing this 17 18 years now I mean it, you know in very different capacities along the way like but uh yeah playing primarily for my main source of income for that long so that's great. Like you said, you didn't ever, you know, like you get you get to keep doing what you're doing. What Doyle Doyle says, you know, we get old when we stop playing, right? Nah. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> absolutely. And that's one of the things I love is I'm always evolving with poker. And you know, and, you know, you asked about what I do to like improve my game, whatever. Actually, I'm I do more of like a, a self reflective. Like I will, you know, uh, when I recognize like, oh, I didn't know what to do with this spot, you know, 
I'll write down something and then come back and like, look at it later and be like, okay, how am I going to fix this? Like, I see this person is exploiting me this way. What would I do to, you know, exploit in that spot? And how can I like reverse it? You know? So I do think about those things and, you know, try and improve in that way. Well, you get to, to live the life you want in the place that you want, you know, doing what you want. Life is good, you know, playing in, in great games. Uh, you can play whenever you'd like, you know, whether it is online or live. What do you do when you're not playing poker? How do you find the balance? Well, and I know COVID kind of throws everything weird, but is there such a thing as kind of like a, a typical week and how you choose to spend your time? Oh, yeah, for sure. I always, people are always like, oh, how, how do you balance being a, a mom and a poker player? And I'm like, or, you know, a mom with having a family or a poker player with having a family. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it one more time. How do you balance having a family with being a poker player? And I'm like, how the hell do you balance being a poker player without a family? Because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for me, like I, there's always something to come home to. And there's always like a a different side. And like, they don't, I come home in the door and, you know, my husband and I, we don't even like talk results on, you know, a very standard basis. He doesn't know if I won or lost. My son doesn't give a shit if I won or lost, you know? Uh, so yeah. So that's like the total balance. And it's like the reset you go home and it's like, Oh, whatever happened to the poker tables happened to the poker tables. Mm -hmm. And that's also one of the reasons that I really love live poker because one of the things that was difficult with online, uh, was that it felt like it, never ended. Like work was always there. Like I'd be at the dinner table, like checking the tables and clicking buttons or like making dinner and playing. And, you know, it was hard because when the games are good, it was like, you had to play. And it was always right there with live. You know, it's what I love about it was like, I left, I went to work, I did work, I came home and I was at home and like, that was it. So yeah, as far as, you know, what I do when I'm not playing poker, I I spend a lot of time with my family. Uh, My son is awesome. I'm very lucky that he's the coolest 14 year old kid in the world. He actually likes his mom. We have a lot of fun together. He's hilarious. Uh, you know, my son, or I mean, my husband's like my best friend. So, you know, I'm always happy to spend time with them. I got my two dogs. I try and work out and stay healthy. And, you know, I like to travel. I mean, I feel like I'm other than, you know, other than the weird little caveat of being a professional poker player, I feel like I'm a relatively normal person. Yeah. You know, to anyone who follows you, uh, you know, on all your different social media channels, and you know, it's not uh, just posing for pictures, you know, that's genuine fun that you're having. And it's always pretty cool to, to see, you know, I mean, even, quite frankly on your twitter bio i'm skipping ahead a few questions just when you mentioned it and it it literally says balancing family with poker with fun while taking as many naps as possible so you get those naps in as well oh i'm such a good napper yes (laughs) (laughs) a nap is an investment in the future that's what i always say (laughs) and and my my husband and son i'm i need more sleep than they do and they both know it and so it's kind of funny because every once in a while it's like you know, kind of suggest like, uh, what do you think about maybe taking a little nap? Cause <laughs> I get, I get, I'm like, I'm like a toddler. I get a little cranky if I get tired. So yeah, I'm pretty good at napping. Cool. I like it. All right. Well, uh, we talk, you know, we're, we're the uh, friendliest poker podcast in town. So a couple questions about friends, um, obviously in poker, having friends is, is a hugely important element of success. You know, we said in the intro, you know, beloved by so many and uh, certainly a, a, you know, someone who contributes positively to the whole source of, you know, the poker community. Who, who do you, you know, you don't have to single specific people out, but are, are there is kind of like a, a group of friends, you know, your, your people, your squad that you consider to be your, your good friends, not just in poker, but, you know, away from the felt as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of like, it's kind of, I don't know where the definition of like friend falls. You know, I have a lot of friends I have, uh, but like, I don't know, you know, friend versus acquaintance. Like there's not a a big group of people that I like hang out with on like a super regular basis that are poker Mm -hmm. players. Most of the people I hang out with are non poker players. Um, I would say, you know, probably the closest, uh, poker friend that I have that I hang out with all the time is, or that would, you know, you guys would know it'd be like David Tuckman. Um, pretty close with him and his wife. We're good friends. Uh, I got a couple others that, uh, you know, the viewers would probably not know their names, but yeah, uh, I have a good mix of poker friends and non-poker friends. Okay, that's fair. Well, David Tuckman, for those who didn't get to listen, he was episode number 17. So, uh, you know, after you watch this show or listen, and after you read, you know, you watch uh, Bet Ray's Fold, Go ahead, check back uh, to episode number 17 uh, here on the Cards Chat podcast. Um, You know, another question we'd like to ask pretty much all of our guests, um, could you perhaps single out one or two of the friendliest people with whom you've played poker? 
Uh, um, the gentleman from Minnesota, the older guy, the, John Morgan. John Morgan's got to be the nicest oh, human alive. Wow. He's literally got to be the nicest human ever in my, in my life. Uh, and then uh, Maury from Poker Go. He's also sure. just incredibly nice. I mean, there's a lot of nice people. Uh, but those two off the top of my head are just people that like, you're just like, just so genuinely kind, you know? It's interesting you mentioned them. I mean, folks like them, they're in their 60s, I guess. Uh, perhaps uh, John Morgan's a little bit older than that even. Um, is it because sort of they have like life experience and stories to tell? I'm I, sorry I for projecting, know, it, but it's just- No, no, it's okay. And, and honestly, uh, I don't, I haven't even played that much with John Morgan. I, but like, you know, I just see him every once in a while. And like, I think they just love poker so mm. much, you know, that it comes through. And But they're also just like genuinely good people, you know? So I don't know. It's just, I mean, like John Morgan, you know, he's, from my understanding, a very wealthy man and he'll, yep. you know, play the super high rollers and then he'll grind a hundred dollar nightly tournament. Like the guy just loves poker and he just treats to me, what makes somebody kind is, and also like, there's, you know, one of my, you asked about my circles in poker. One of my like best friends, his name is uh, Peter. And uh, I met him through poker. He's not a professional. He's very much not a professional. <laughs> he's a a fun poker player but okay. you know him along with those guys the thing that to me makes you like a nice person is they treat you know the janitor the same way that they treat the ceo like they're just they treat everybody well and uh yeah so that's just like something that pops out in my head right now when i think of nice people in poker it's awesome and, and you know, i gotta say you know i've uh, this is episode number 67 and beyond these uh many dozens i've interviewed quite a few poker players and um there's definitely that just a, a normal person kind of vibe coming from you. And it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I like it. I enjoy it. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, you know, there's a lot of normal people out there who are just fans of the game, fun players. We just, you know, like myself, enjoy playing in the, in the home game once a week, that sort of a thing. And yet, you know, there's always that, you know, oh, maybe, maybe I could make it. Maybe I could just oh, go pro, something like that, you know, and you know, you're someone, normal person who's gone ahead and, and kind of blazed that path. Besides a healthy bankroll, you know, solid bankroll management and, and knowledge of the game, if you were to have to like spout out a couple of tips for someone who has aspirations to do more in poker, regular person kind of like, you know, want to start climbing that ladder, anything you'd recommend? Uh, I would say to not neglect your mental game. Like don't, you know, a lot of people, they worried about the X and the Y disease. They want to run solvers. They want to watch strategy videos and whatnot, you know, but then they might have all the skills in the world, but they don't know how to be a professional. And then they, you know, take a couple beats and they get tilted and things fall apart. And now all that hard work you've done is unwrapped by, you know, five minutes of losing your focus and getting into a rage tilt. And, you know, that's a really hard thing to overcome. And, uh, you know, I've said it, before multiple times there are a lot of players i know who are more far more talented at poker than i have ever been that are no longer playing poker for a living because they couldn't manage you know the emotional control they couldn't uh you know stay away from the pits they couldn't you know have that discipline they couldn't leave when they were stuck like those kind of things so i think you know if you I think it's literally impossible to be a professional poker player if you cannot learn how. To, I mean, of course, we're all going to have our moments. I can be a tilt monkey still, you know, have my moments. Like, but <laughs> uh, you know, there's some people who just, you know, that they just have that switch and it happens, you know, all the time. So if you can't control that and learn how to deal with the losses um, and learn how to deal with the variance and understand the variance and all that, I feel like you, like you can have all the talent in the world. Doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to like overcome that hurdle. So I feel like that's like step one. And I think that's something that often gets neglected in the, you know, beginning stages of learning poker. Yeah, so, solid tip. Um, well, we know the word professional, you know, as far as poker means that, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a multimillionaire or anything. It just means that that's what you do to make a living. Um, would you say that it's possible to do that at the lowest live stakes offered at one, two, at one, three, or, you know, it's, there are just too many obstacles to that that you kind of need to play minimum to five to to make it as a professional. I got to be honest, I'm so out of touch with what, you know, 
I, and I, that's, that sounds like an, I, that came out kind of like an area way. I didn't mean to no, be that way. But I'm fair. just saying, like, You're I have no idea. I theory. have no idea what the rake structure is of one, two. I have no okay. idea what, how tough the player pulls. You know, like if I, when I play one, two, I'm going in because I'm, uh, you know, drunk and I'm having fun. And like, it's, you know, right. it seems like a fun game, but I don't know what the rake is. Like, I don't, you know. Uh, and also, there's just things that vary. Like, what kind of living expenses do you have? Do you have a family to support? Or, you, you know, I feel like you can take more risks when it's just, you know, you as a young person trying to find your way and, you know, whatnot. Uh, so it's just, kind of a question I don't really feel like I can even fully okay. answer. That's fair. And, and I like the honesty there and, and thank you. So so I will pivot then uh, slightly, you know, at some point you were playing lower stakes. You had mentioned you got some sort of backing originally. Now you're playing high stakes. You know, at some there, there was some sort of a path and I, I don't imagine it was one day you woke up, you know, maybe it was, I don't know. Like, how, did, how did that sort of happen for you, you know, when you, moved up to, to playing the higher stakes from, from playing lower. Yeah, it's funny looking back because I wish I had a better idea myself for the timeline because I don't really remember when XYZ happened. You know, I know that like I was playing with an irresponsible amount of my bankroll at the table, like, you know, five cent, 10 cent. And I know that, you know, that it was like, you know, 25 cent, 50 cent. And um, so, you know, I did start and grind it up. I, I remember specifically one of like a, pivot point was I had been there was this player that was a ton of action I think I was playing him like one two or something like that or two four and I you know he left the table and I player searched his name as everybody did back in that day I know it's bum hunting but we all did it let's not you know I was the and, bum and I did it yes <laughs> <laughs> and he was sitting at a 510 cap game and on full tilt they had these like 30 big blind cap games and I had never played this game before didn't know anything about it and wasn't bankrolled to play it, but I followed him up and ended up winning like seven buy-ins or something. And I was like, cap games are the best and players for my life. Like I've got it made, you know? Um, and I know that, you know, there were some variants in there and, you know, whatnot. And I was like, oh, maybe cap games aren't the best. I don't know. But I do know that the first transition from, you know, kind of the mid stakes forever to high stakes was then I got pretty good at these cap games and uh, they had them at 2550. And so I would like jump up there and, you know, it was a fit like $1,500 or, or yeah, I think like 1500. Yeah, 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 cap and um, would play those. And so that's kind of how I got my start to like the high stakes, but it was like a, a capped high stakes. And then once I was there, you know, sometimes players that would be the only game going. So even good players would be very, very bad at cap games. So, but it would be the highest that would be going sometimes they'd hop in. So that kind of became my specialty. And then from there, I would like table select play regular 2550 and uh, it just kind of all went from there but yeah i mean i did go through the normal you know playing two four and you know five ten you know i just don't know how long i was doing you know each that's fair, that's fair. um we've met you know it's important to change gears at the poker table so we'll change gears ever so slightly in the questioning you mentioned a couple times um being a woman in the game obviously has helped you you know raise your profile that sort of thing more than it perhaps otherwise would have been raised you know if you were not a woman um we got plenty of you know women listeners PF, in the cards chat community. Um, so as a woman in the game, is there any particular advice you have for women who are coming up who want to get more involved, that sort of thing? Um, I think just don't be intimidated. And I know that that's hard, you know, because it is, it's an intimidating environment when you're a female, but just, I think that we learn a lot of things and we uh, experience a lot of benefits in life when we kind of like face some fears, you know, and, and uh, instead of like running away and avoiding anxieties, just kind of like taking them head on. So uh, I know it can be intimidating at first, but I think, you know, just taking that leap, that first step into, you know, sitting in a game and just try to forget that you're even like, you know, just, you're just a person, you're a poker player, like, and um, I don't know, I just think it's great that so many women are playing the game and that it, I, I feel like more and more, you know, we've got some crazy su successful female players and I think that's like awesome. Uh, so I don't, yeah, I don't know. I just, I would just say, just do it. Just like, you know, get yourself out there and don't be, I don't know. I, I felt like when I was first playing live poker, I did feel like a sense of almost like if I did something stupid at the table or like, or not even stupid, if I like made a mistake at the table or something that I deemed other people would think was stupid, I would be like, oh, now they're just going to think I'm a dumb, you know, woman. And like, and yeah. I don't, I don't like that. And it made me like uncomfortable. And I think that that mm -hmm. altered my play a little bit. Um, be shameless. Like 
mm. show your bluff. Like, you know, just like turn your head, just like whatever. Like you got to get to a point where you're comfortable enough with yourself that you can just play your game and not give a shit about what other people think about your game. And I think that it, it is a tough path to get to and it took me a while, but I think that that's probably like the biggest improvement that I've maybe made, um, you know, as I've gone along as I'm like, you know, confident enough now that I'm just like, oh, whatever, you win some, you lose some. And you have to be willing to look like an idiot to be really good. Like you just have to. I mean, you look at all the best players in the world. Sometimes, you know, they like Vanessa Selps, you know, she's a female is a great example. Like that's what makes Vanessa Selps Vanessa Selps is she's like a genius, but she's also fearless. She has, if she thinks she's right, she has gives zero fucks if people are going to think she looks stupid. She don't give a fuck. She's Vanessa Selps. Right. You know, exactly. like, I mean, you got to channel that inner kind of tiger, you know? I don't know if it's the specific hand. I don't know why when you said that, I was like, oh, like Vanessa Selps in that hand, like that specific hand. I, I don't know what it was. Like there was. Yeah, I think there was one where I don't know. She's just like, what are this? I mean, she's done a couple. She's, but that's great. And that's, you know, I, I think that's a sign of a truly good player. Is no shame. Just, exactly. Like yeah. You just, if you think it's right, like go with it and don't worry about, you know, what anybody else is going to think. And if it doesn't work out, whatever. Cool. Now put that in your back pocket and figure out what that did for your image and how you can use it to win money in the future. For sure. For sure. Well, you know, woman or man, you know, one thing we all experience, you know, recreational, professional uh, in this game is variance. Um, and cash game players, I think, maybe I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm primarily a cash game player, but I'm a wreck, you know, but um, I think they experience variance very differently uh, than tournament players do. Um, what is it like for you dealing with both downswings and upswings? Well, it used to be when I was younger, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, it was difficult. I think that, that you just kind of have to like, it's one of those things that only experience can really get you better at, you know? Um, yeah. And also just a, a basic understanding of variance. Cause I was really lucky. Like I didn't understand the mathematics of variance. Um, like my husband understood it long before I did. And he was always like on my team, you know? So it was like, I had him to kind of talk me through like, this doesn't mean that you're not good. You know, it doesn't mean you're a bad poker player. It doesn't mean you can't make it. doesn't mean you're not good enough. It's just, here's, you know, whatever. And so, um, yeah, I, I used to not handle it very well at all, but I, and I, like I said, I think that's one of the biggest like improvements I've made is learning how to deal with that. And now, uh, you know, I always joke that you could put me up to like a blood pressure machine and I could be in like it, a massive pot and I could, and like a river card can like, and, and more often than not, I'm not, there's sometimes, but more often than not, if I haven't been running bad for a long time already, or, you know, I won't feel like anything, like I almost just feel like numb to it. Um, and I think that's kind of like a self protective That's kind of how you, you sort of need to be to some extent, you know, that right. being said, I think that variance admittedly is easier for me because I have a husband who, you know, he has a regular job. So our family uh -huh. has a paycheck, you know, I might make more money, but I say is like what he makes is more important to our family mm -hmm. because it's there every month. And, and so having that in the back of my head, you know, relieves some pressure for sure. And has been very helpful. Interesting. I don't know when you, when you said it also about like the, the call, I forget what the name of the show was, but there used to be that poker show that hooked players up to like the pulse meter or whatever it was. So it's interesting to, to hear that perspective. Um, just a couple last questions for me before we move into the community questions. Um, you know, it's always a little bit, it's a little bit different preparing, doing interview prep and, and, and speaking to someone who's primarily a cash game player. So many of the, of the known names, faces that we all know and hear about is from tournament reporting, is from tournament results. Um, you do, however, have 10 results on your hand and mob. So, do I? Sweet. Yes, you do. There you go. Right? <laughs> That's 10 more than I do. Now, so. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, though, so I was like, I looked at it, I was like, well, what question do I ask here? I was like, well, I kind of want to know, well, when you decide to play a tournament, what is it that makes you make that decision when you're most, mostly a cash game player and that's just, you know, what you do? So if you're going a little bit outside of your, of your box, why do you decide to, to register for the tournament in the first place? What, what is it about uh, those that's, 10 that's or more? A, that's a super easy question. I do. Okay. It's going to be fun. When, it's, when it sounds appealing to me, it sounds like a fun tournament. Uh, to me, the idea of being like a daily tournament is like a nightmare. I don't want to leave the house and not have control over whether I'm going to, you know, come home and have the rest of the day open in an hour or nice. have the next three days tied up. Like that's, that's not doing that on a regular basis sounds 
that's like a nightmare. I, I value my independence, my freedom, my ability to just like, oh, I'm not feeling it today. I'm going home, whatever. So I basically only play tournaments that I think are going to be fun. You know, okay. ladies event is fun. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, I just played the run good pro-am series and sure. that was super fun. Yeah. And the main event is just the main event. Like, how do you not play it? It's so much fun. <laughs> so, th- I mean, that's basically it. I haven't played them yet, but I would be interested in playing like wins got these mystery bounties and that looks fun. Okay. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do that, you know, but otherwise I'm just have no interest in leaving my house to go grind like a regular tournament. It just doesn't sound, doesn't sound fun. Good answer. I like it. To me, Let's... tournament poker is like not my job, you know? Right. So if I'm going to be doing that, it's going to be, you know, yeah, I want to make money, but there's also got to be some enjoyment, entertainment, you know, factor out of it. Nice. I like it. All right. Well, we just uh, turned the page uh, into 2022. Uh, again, things are kind of, sort of, I guess, you know, a little bit up in the air still with the, with the world situation being what it is. Do you have plans or, 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 or goals that you set for yourself uh, for the rest of this year? And if so, uh, could you share any of them with us? I am taking it one day at a time. I, you know, I just feel like everything's kind of crazy right now. And uh, something that I try and really like model and teach my son is to not stress or worry about the things that are like, you know, you can't do anything about right now. So I don't know right now I've got this like app game and that's, yeah. I don't know if that's going to end in two days or in a year. So, uh, you know, I'm just focused on what I think is the best thing for like right now and for, you know, today. And today it's to just hang out with my family and maybe play the app game, you know, three times a week or something like that. Or, you know, uh, I don't, I don't put like a goals as far as like, you know, I want to win this much or I want to play this much or, you know, things like that. Uh, my goals are more like, you know, I want to keep improving as a player. I want to maintain balance. I want to stay happy. Like I don't need all the money in the world. I want to, you know, be happy and have good relationships with my family and friends and experience new things and travel. And, you know, like those are, those are like my goals, not so much like, Oh, I need to win this much or play this much or, you know, whatever. It's just it's very kind of ever changing dynamic situation. And I'm okay with that. I love it. Uh, and I just, I gotta, I don't know what's going on out there. You guys, if you're, you know, when you're listening to this or, or watching, but like, I don't know, I hear that answer. I'd be like, yeah, me too. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that, that sounds like a great goal to have. That, that's really I, wonderful. Uh, you know, I think that we tend to worry about a lot of things that are out of control and, uh, I try to, you know, again, I tried to something, try to teach my son is that if you worry about something and you can't control it and then it like doesn't happen, you know, well, you worried for no reason. Right. And if you worried about something for so long and then it does happen, well, you just doubled the amount of like angst that you needed to happen, you know, so right. just kind of learning to like, if you can't control it or there's nothing you do about it or, or nothing that you're going to choose to do about it right now. I'm just like, let it go and try and, you know, focus on the now. Sounds good. I like the approach. Um, it's really cool. Well, we now turn to the second segment of our show where we turn to you guys, our Cards Chat community, to see what questions you wanted to ask our guests. We have a dedicated thread on the Cards Chat forums for this. So as we announce who the future guests will be, please be sure to send in your questions. And the first question comes from Bella Donna 5 Thank you very much, Bella Donna. It's a name I haven't oh, seen before, so thank you so much. I think I know much. who this is, actually. Oh, okay. Think- <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, well, this is the question that Bella Donna asked, uh, and thank you for submitting it. Uh, Danielle, what are the best and worst outcomes you experienced after being in a documentary about your poker life? Oh, that's a good question. Mm-hmm. The best uh, was just, it was really cool to just kind of all of a sudden I went from like not really feeling like I was a part of the poker community to all of a sudden, you know, like people, I mean, I'm just like a poker fan and like at the premiere, I'll never forget, like freaking Tom Dwan walks up to me and taps me on the shoulder and is like, hey, Danielle, my name is Tom, like loved the, and I'm like, uh, I fucking know your name is Tom. Like, you know, like, and he, like Dwan is introducing himself to me. Like that was just really cool, you know? Um, and just kind of being thrown into that and just having people that are like my idols, you know, who are like having conversations with me and, and you know, saying nice things. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I, that, was, that was fun, that was cool. Uh, as far as the worst thing about the documentary, um, I don't know if I would say it was worse, but just as I mentioned, it was really difficult to have a camera in my face during what was a very vulnerable, very difficult time, you know, uh, 
I mean, you just think, you know, for you listeners, like you think to some time in your life when it might be different circumstances, but when you've kind of felt it like your rock bottom and then now picture somebody there with a camera in your face asking questions about like, you know, well, what do you think this means for the future? Like, well, I think my future's fucked. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, so yeah. <laughs> that was difficult in the moment. Again, I'm glad I did it, but I would say that was probably, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's like it's the worst thing. I don't really feel like there's something like bad that has happened to me as a result of the whole experience. I, I feel incredibly blessed, honestly. Um, I feel like it was a very positive thing and I, I have no regrets, but that was the most difficult. Great question, great answer. Um, Acid Burn FX, uh, you know, always uh, <laughs> love the love the name, <laughs> love the most creative questions, really love it. Um, so uh, what does, okay, we got a few here. Uh, do you like telling people that you're a professional poker player? It depends on the scenario, honestly. Um, I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes if, well, if I'm like in an Uber or something, it's just like, I'm just going from point A to point B. Uh, I don't, you know, like uh, the, the questions can get kind of like repetitive and I don't really know you and we're not gonna have a relationship in the future. So right. I just don't, you know, that's just like a path. I'm just like, uh, you know, a lot of times I'll just like avoid that question. Uh, but, you know, I do like it when, you know, let's say like I'm, my husband, you know, it's like a work party for him or something and, right. and people are like interested in it and, you know, they're and then, you know, it's kind of like makes him proud. He's like, ah, I got the cool poker player wife, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> So in those circumstances, like, yeah, I do. And I, and in those circumstances, I never get tired of the questions. Like, cause I, I also kind of enjoy, I like when people ask the questions because I know there are a lot of like misconceptions about poker players and what that means. And, you know, so I think I've, you know, got a lot of those answers down pretty solid and kind of like yeah. uh, break some preconceived notions. Awesome. Uh, uh, I like it a lot. Um, yeah, no, I, I'll just say, you know, from what I've seen and heard over this last hour, certainly uh, represent that normal person just doing a unconventional type of job pretty damn I, well. I feel uh, like I'm gonna interrupt you for one second because I feel like I have a quick little story that uh, your listeners might enjoy. Please in do. To that. Uh, you know, I said like usually if it's like an anonymous situation where I'm not gonna have a relationship with this person, I won't say anything. And one of the things that actually like started me like not answering honestly in those situations was I was on a plane. It was like a six hour plane ride. And uh, this gentleman was sitting next to me and somehow I was going to play like some game or something. I mentioned I was a poker player. Well, he was a priest. And for like the next six hours, he literally, I mean, went on and on about like how he feels like God has a better calling for me. And um, he feels like God brought us here together. And, you know, and just like, I mean, I literally put on my headphones and put my head against the window to like stop the conversation he fucking tapped my shoulder and woke me like and wanted to continue on and I was just like <laughs> I don't need this right now like I don't you know so um so yeah that was a little bit traumatic and I was just stuck there with him and you know at the end he wanted to like pray that I would have oh, guidance on my path and all that shit so wow so, yeah. it's, okay you know, you know, it's a little bit dicey to, you never know what sort of uh answer you're going to get with a random person when you go into that conversation so well, I, I not 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 to flip it around make it about me but i can't help it you know as a, as a very odd uh you know that it's a religious jewish person does what i do and i always just let's say exactly the opposite i say well I, that's what i specifically feel that this is my calling and i could say hey a religious jewish person could do this too not just what we typically do so yeah, yeah. very interesting um and acid burn fx also wants to know what is the biggest non-poker bet you've ever made I don't really like, I'm not super quick. Most poker players who play the stakes I do, they like bet on everything and for yeah. huge amounts all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I, he keeps me in check with that because I almost, it's not that he like tells me I can't by any means, but when he works so hard for, you know, uh, a certain amount of money, like I don't, I feel like irresponsible and like disrespectful to just be like, casually you know flipping coins for it or like you know whatnot but uh i would say you know like the i mean i did like the 5k bench press bet with lily coletto all right um and 
I mean, that was probably like the biggest I actually bet on like something that was like an undetermined outcome. I've <laughs> flipped for more sometimes in games, uh, you know, it's just kind of part of it at the end, you know, you do right. flips and whatever, but yeah, I'm not, I'm less of a degenerate than most poker players in that regard. <laughs> well, that's, it's just interesting that you know, since you mentioned it, um, you know, it's, it's so important from what I've heard, again, I'm not a professional, but to be able to remove that real money factor you know, okay, I'm betting a car now or something like that when you're actually playing, but it seems like you're incredibly well grounded based on your answer to that question once you step away from the felt, you know, you know, five bucks is still five bucks. Yeah, yeah I'm, I feel like I'm lucky to have been able to like compartmentalize that kind of thinking, you know, mm -hmm. because because uh, it is, and again, I think that having, you know, a husband who I see how hard he works and, you know, what his paycheck is or whatever, I think that that's like a natural grounding point nice. that makes it probably easier for me than it does for other people because it is, you know, it's hard mm -hmm. to care about, you know, when you're flipping for X amount, it's hard to care about, you know, smaller amounts here and there like why, right. it, you know you become sort of like indifferent to it and there is a, a level of healthy indifference and that it's a tough line of balance where it goes to like an unhealthy indifference you know yeah, yeah i agree um pirate glenn is our last uh, question asker today so thank you very much pirate glenn for sending this one in uh good question here how did you originally get involved slash sponsored by um, uh, ultimate poker uh well, Full Tilt had reached out to me after the documentary came out because uh, to kind of like bring the, well, it was after PokerStars had bought Full Tilt, I should say. Oh, okay, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry. It was it was like Full Tilt, you know, the second go around. Uh, 2.0. So yeah. really <laughs> PokerStars, yeah. Uh, and they wanted to put me in the main event to play like my first, or I don't know, if, I think it was my first, I don't know, main event. Um, as kind of like a a full circle to that story, you know? Okay. Uh, and so I got to know some of the people on the staff there. And then when ultimate ultimate started, some of the people were there and it just kind of was like, uh -huh. you know, um, yeah, they were familiar with me and there probably weren't too many females that, you know, were like somewhat known and had a, okay. you know, a little bit of a following at that time. So it just was a opportunity that worked out for me. Cool. I got pretty lucky, basically, again. <laughs> right. Okay, cool. Um, and I guess we'll go with this last one. Uh, great question. I like this one. Uh, thank you, Pirate Glenn. Uh, Danielle, if you could choose any five guests for dinner, famous, non-famous, who would they be? Oh, man. Great question. Such on the spot question, though. <laughs> I feel like I need to, like, We'll give you pause. a time bank or two. We won't call the clock. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, was you say live or whether again? it's famous or not famous, it doesn't matter who five uh, guests who you'd like to have for dinner. Uh, well, one, I mean, I'd definitely like to see my grandma again, who passed away. That's definitely like one, uh, she would have, she passed away before I ever started playing poker and she would have thought that it was the coolest thing ever. Cause she loved her lottery tickets. She loved any form <laughs> okay. of gambling. She would have been very proud. Um, other than that. I really, I like Lady Gaga. I think okay. she's very interesting. I love Lady Gaga. I don't know why. I just find her crazy and interesting. The poker um, face sign. Maybe uh, I feel song. like there's got to be some sort of like a great athlete in there. Like Muhammad Ali has got to like, that would be an interesting guy to sit down and talk to. Um, and I have some like mutual acquaintances that are family members of his. And from what they oh. say, however great of a person he was like, portrayed in the media and whatever uh that he was actually like even better wow. in person that he was like that peer yeah i, kn I know his son-in-law the one that's married to rashida that's um, pretty cool. yeah so he says that you know whatever however great they, they say he is that he was actually even better like as a person as a family man so so there's three um i don't know i'm totally blanking on this one uh, Corey doesn't get an invite so wait oh, oh wait live okay oh, hold on okay come on this is a trap <laughs> <laughs> if you could choose any five guests uh, for dinner famous or non-famous well i mean is it like one dinner like do i get to have dinner with him tomorrow night like is this my last dinner i mean <laughs> what are we talking about here sure if it's my last dinner I'm i suppose my kidding. husband and kid i know i know i'm just season two uh <laughs> I mean, he's an interesting dude, my husband, don't get me wrong, but I mean, you know, I, I got to pick him over, you know, 
Michael Jordan for like a one-time sit-down thing, you know? Okay. I don't know. We'll give you Michael um, Jordan. We'll get, we'll right, get we'll one last Michael one. We'll Michael Jordan. I feel like we got to get one more. Like, there's got to be somebody like super historical. Uh, I don't know. I'm reading, I'm reading a book. I'm reading a book about Abraham Lincoln right now, and he seems like a very interesting dude. There you go. Okay. So that'll enough. kind of be a cop-out answer, just since I have that in the back of my head reading it. <laughs> reading well, that, that's head. totally fine. That's your Fab Five. So thank you yeah. very much. Be a to funny everyone. dinner. Yeah, that'd be a very interesting. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who sent in questions for Danielle Anderson. And again, just a friendly reminder to all of you out there in the Cards Chat community. We'd love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guests in the dedicated thread on the forums. Guys, please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes. Spread the word via your social media channels if you like the show. Danielle, it's been really, really great speaking with you. Anything else before we let you go? No, just thanks for having me. This was fun. And, uh, you know, I've never really been somebody that like participates much in, in forums and whatnot, but uh, I do know some of the cards chat people and every, you guys really is true. Every single person I know is like an incredibly nice human being. So I think what you guys got going there with like a positive, you know, uh, environment and attitude and stuff is just awesome. And poker needs more of that. So uh, keep doing, keep on keeping on and thanks for having me. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Cards Chat. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>